So, um, hi everybody, I'm Erica Larson. Um, as Isaac said, I'm with the National Non-Point Source Program in DC, out of EPA. Um, you know, I, I recognize this is kind of a, a non-traditional, atypical presentation for the Crop Management School, so I really appreciate you all being here this morning and, and your interest. Um, a little background about myself, I, I've been with EPA about five years. I'm a soil scientist, so my, my background really is in soil fertility and, and row crop ag fields. Um, and now at EPA, I work on kind of a variety of voluntary measures to, to work with the ag community to reduce um, nutrient losses from, from farm fields. So many different ag stakeholders, and um, as part of that, I work on the 319 program. So I guess first I just want to ask how many people are familiar with the 319 program? Okay, a few. So a few more than, than last year. So what I'm going to do is, um, <clears throat> excuse me, talk about uh, what this program is and let you kind of get an understanding of how the money is spent and how you might be able to help or, or tap into some of these resources and why the voluntary approach to the 319 program has been so successful. Um, I'll talk about the kind of what non-point source pollution is, what the section of the 319 of the Clean Water Act is, so you're just going to have to bear with me for a little bit as I go through um, some of the Clean Water Act um, terminology. And then the meat of the presentation is really going to be talking about the watershed approach, why watershed planning is, is so important and stakeholder and local stakeholder involvement is, is so important. And, and then I'm going to end with um, kind of our, our agricultural uh, prog programs and partnerships kind of from a non-regulatory standpoint and end with a few successful case studies. So. Um, the, the focus of this is really from our non-regulatory incentive-based program. What I'm not going to do is talk about Chesapeake Bay TMDL um, or other some regulatory programs that you all might be more familiar with. This is, this is um, more focused on our work with, with the ag community. So um, in, in talking to some of the organizers, they thought it might be good to include a background slide on where the Office of Water and where our agriculture programs fit within EPA. So um, to start, there's obviously the Office of the Administrator, that's the head of the EPA, and then under the Administrator there are program offices. So many of you are probably familiar with the Office of Pesticides, um, the Office of Air and Radiation is another program office. I'm going to be focusing on the Office of Water. And under the Office of Water there are four other offices. Um, there's the Office of Groundwater and Drinking Water. This is where the Safe Drinking Water Act is, is administered. There's the Office of Science and Technology. This is where kind of the water quality standards and criteria are established. Um, and then really when we talk about ag, which is what I'm going to be talking about primarily, um, we, we have the Office of Wastewater Management, which I call my kind of sister office and the CAFO program. And then we have the Office of Wetlands, Oceans, and Watersheds, and that's where I sit. And this is where our work with uh, the um, row crop community and the ag community fits under the uh, 319 of the Clean Water Act. So the regulatory programs that, that you're likely familiar with are, are in a different office than where, where I sit and where I'll be talking about. This is in our Office of Wastewater Management, and this is the CAFO program. You're probably familiar with the National Pollutant Discharge Elimination System. But when we talk about kind of row crop ag, that's under this unregulated um, section of the Clean Water Act, which is the 319 program, and I'll, I'll talk about what that is. So, so first what I'm going to do is just kind of uh, lay out the challenge that, that we're all, all facing, and that's kind of the magnitude of, of the water quality problems. So many people think about non-point sources as also called polluted runoff, um, and, and this is a significant issue across the country. So. Um, what I have here is our, our national water quality inventory. It's called Clean Water Act 305B. Basically, what's important to note is this is how states report on the conditions of their assessed waters. And so what we know is that of the about 550,000 um, impaired miles of rivers and streams across the country, about 80 to 85 of them are caused by non-point sources. Um, this National Water Quality Inventory is reported directly from the state, so the state agencies, um, and it's really a vehicle for informing the public and, and Congress on the nation's, the, the status, status of our nation's waters. So, you know, we, we know that ag is a, a significant um, contributor to our, our issue um, across the country, but, but another point I really want to make is the second cause here. 
So what this is saying is states have, have marked unknown as um, the most probable source of impairment here, on the, kind of second on the list. This is really important to note because that, that's a challenge in addressing the water quality issues across the country when, when the sources are unknown. And so this has become a, a priority for many of the states and for us is to better understand what those sources are. Diving in a little bit further into kind of what the impairments are, we all know about the, the nutrient issue across the country. We're, we're here in the Chesapeake Bay. Um, and so what I'm, I'm doing in this slide is just providing some, some summary statistics on the, the magnitude of the issue um, from that report that I just mentioned, the National Water Quality um, Inventory, about 17,000 or more um, water bodies don't meet water quality standards due to nutrient issues. And um, we know that there's over 150 hypoxic zones across the country. This is obviously caused by, by nutrients, but it's point sources and non-point sources. So it's the regulated and the, and the unregulated community um, contributing. And then from um, what this graph is showing here is it's our National Aquatic Resources Survey. It's really kind of a snapshot of the, the conditions of our nation's waters. It's conducted by EPA and states. I'll talk about it a little bit more later. Um, and what we know from these, these surveys, these are the survey points across the country, is that about 42% of our lakes are, are, um, are threatened due to nutrients, nutrient pollutions. 60% uh, coastal estuarine areas, and, and about 65% of our rivers and streams have uh, issues related to nutrients. So this is a, you know, a significant concern. It, it is a priority for EPA, and it's a priority for many states as well as they work to improve um, water quality across the country. And one reason why this is so important is that uh, non-point source pollution is really diverse and widespread. Okay, so. You know, we often hear ag as, as a big um, contributor for, for non-point sources, and while it is, there are many other sources out there that, that need to be addressed. Um, and so agriculture, you know, contributes nutrient sediment and pathogens um, at times, but there's also onset uh, septic systems that contribute uh, issues as well. These are nutrients and pathogens primarily. There's acid mine drainage. Um, we also know that urban and suburban areas that are not regulated also contribute significant um, pathogens, fertilizer, et cetera, to our water bodies, and they, they need to be controlled. Um, we have forestry as well, and, and hydro modifications such as um, you know, channel straightening, et cetera. So the point here is that in any given watershed, there can be hundreds of sources of pollution. And so we, we have to work uh, collaboratively, comprehensively to address, to address all of these. All right, so how, now I'm getting into um, the, the Clean Water Act itself, and some of you may already be familiar with non-point sources and point sources, but it's important to, to make sure we're all on the same page here, um, especially when I go into Section 319 of the Clean Water Act. But basically, point sources are regulated um, entities under the Clean Water Act. They're the important kind of uh, terms to, to identify are conveyances that discharge, okay? so. These are um, typically pipes, ditches, channels, et cetera, and, and CAFOs are part of the regulated um, community. But to kind of give you a universe of what the regulated CAFO community is, about 2% of livestock farms across the country are considered CAFOs. Um, of that, about 30% claim to, to discharge to what we say waters of the U.S. That leaves us with about 1%, less than 1% of all livestock farms across the country that are um, require this, this permit for the federal permitting process. So um, non-point sources, this is the area, as I mentioned, that I work. This is our national non-point source program. Basically, this is anything that's not regulated under the Clean Water Act. They're not defined. But what I will say is that agriculture, stormwater discharge, and irrigation return flows are explicitly exempt under the federal Clean Water Act. Okay, so to, to make sure we're all on the same page, row crop ag is not regulated under the federal Clean Water Act. Um, we work on voluntary incentive-based programs, and we know, um, you know how, how these have been effective. Some of you may be working in states where there are more stringent regulations for row crop ag. Um, the, the point I want to make is that those go above and beyond the federal Clean Water Act. That's, that's um, the state's decision. And so there are other uh, programs at the state level that you may be, may be working with, but that's beyond um, the Federal Clean Water Act scope. 
So for those of you, many of you are not, not um, familiar with the Clean Water Act, it's uh, Section 319 of the Clean Water Act. It's a relatively small um, part of the Clean Water Act, and there's two kind of important points to, to note. The first is, so I'm going to be using some of this kind of 319B, 319H, but really it, it, there's two programs. There's the 319B, which is the state management program. This is basically the program that lays out the state's priorities. It's developed by the state agencies. And when I say state agencies, I'm referring to kind of the, the water quality agencies, the DNRs, the DEQs, et cetera. Um, and they develop their priorities, and they develop what's called a five-year non-point source management plan um, that, that has a lot of stakeholder involvement. After that plan has been developed, then they, that guides the grant program. And often what happens through the grant program is that the state solicits an RFP. Some of you may, may want to um, know about the RFP processes in your state. You may be able to uh, receive funding to implement some of these projects. Um, and that, so, so the, the grants really reflect the program priorities from, from the state. So really how is the funding spent? So the 319 is about a 165-ish um, million dollar program annually. That's about one to eight million dollars per state. And um, the, the federal funding really goes to the states to support, support their non-point source program. So um, one thing that's required is a 40 percent non-federal match. So the state is also in using um, their funds to invest in their non-point source priorities. But what we know is that many states are investing way above and beyond this, that leveraging is happening two to four times what's required, which just shows there's a lot of stakeholder investment. There's a lot of interest in making sure that these funds are, are utilized and used effectively to, to improve water quality. And there's a lot of kind of vested support and interest in the program. Um, one requirement is that there's a 50 for 50 percent split of funds. And I'll talk about kind of how the, the funds are used, but half of the funds go to support the non-point source management program. That's often staff, state staff, um, or the development of the, the plan itself. But to ensure that there's you know, robust environmental on-the-ground projects, there's a 50% um, requirement to have on-the-ground projects as well, which can go to support a variety of activities like conservation practice implementation, um, monitoring, et cetera. So here's just an example of kind of how the 319 funds are spent and why um, they're, they're really kind of what we call the catalyst to, to get all st many different stakeholders involved in, in the process. So um, local staff, as I mentioned, there's state staff, but then there's also local staff. Um, conservation districts are the number one recipient of 319 ag funds. They are critical partners and players, thank you, um, to, to deliver on the ground conservation through 319 programs. Um, and we rely on them to, to help us out with these programs. There's also landowner outreach and technical assistance that kind of complement the USDA funds. Um, watershed plans, which I'm going to talk about in more detail, these are funded through 319 and they're really critical for kind of laying out the roadmap to ensuring water quality success in a watershed. Um, and then also to ensure that our, our program is effectively improving water quality, we have monitoring components as well, and many states are using funding to, to conduct in-stream water quality monitoring. So in the next couple slides, I'm just going to show us kind of a, a sample distribution of over a five-year period of how the 319 funds were, were spent. I mentioned ag as a priority, and you'll see here that the majority um, you know, of all of the resource types, ag, has the, the greatest number of projects funded in this, in this five-year period, and this is also reflective in our um, more recent data as well. But again, many other uh, non-point sources that, that we are controlling through the 319 program, what I will be focusing on is our agriculture components. And here's just kind of a geographic distribution of the 319 ag-related projects across the country. And you'll see that they, they really um, you know, reflect where some of the heavily row crop ag areas are across the country. So in the Midwest, in the Corn Belt, obviously in the western part of the country in California, and the Chesapeake Bay region as well. And many of these projects, um, the 319 funds, are, are spending money on on-the-ground conservation practice implementation of kind of what we call high-impact conservation practices for water quality improvements, 
those that avoid, control, trap nutrients, sediment, pathogens, et cetera. Um, and so this is just kind of a snapshot of some of the projects that were funded in the same five-year period. Um, many of you are probably very familiar with some of these practices. Um, <clears throat> so what I want to talk about briefly is just how how we know that this, this, this program is working and how we're measuring success. So we have what's called the 319 success story database. Um, some of you may be familiar. If not, I encourage you to, to check out where this is, is going on in your state. This is our program accountability measure, which basically are the, the number of watersheds that have been fully or partially restored due to non-point source efforts. Um, and so these are all you know, relying on the voluntary approach the, um, right now, the number is at, as of yesterday, 731. So these are across the country, and what you'll see is that over time, this approach has led to water quality progress in, in all of the states. And so again, if you Google EPA uh, success stories, you can see where, where the water bodies have improved in your state and you know, what partners have, have contributed to those successes. Um, and I'm going to kind of describe three of those success stories at the end of the presentation. Sure. Uh, cumulative. cumulative, yes, thank you. Yep, good point. So uh, usually about 50 or more water bodies are added each year to the, to the success story database. And why you know, we're able to, to see so much um, traction and, and change and, and growth in these programs, which has led to overall success from kind of an environmental outcomes perspective, is because the ability to leverage other uh, local buy-in and also other um, you know, stakeholder investment, which is, is really key in particular for our agriculture um, projects and programs. And so often 319 programs, project funds are used in concert with USDA funds. And this is really how the program works best, which is where 319 money comes in and, and um, you know, provides some assistance for, for outreach, technical assistance, on the ground staff, um, watershed planning, and then USDA funds come in and are able to kind of um, use those plans to target critical areas and invest um, the right practices in the right areas. And I'll talk about um, why that's important for, for the kind of water quality planning in, in, a, in a few minutes. So we couldn't do all of this just through our 319 program. And this, this slide doesn't um, you know, list all. It's not a comprehensive list of partners that we rely on to, to improve water quality. But this does list just some of our, our um, Primary partners, I've already mentioned, you know, NRCS and, and the Soil and Water Conservation Districts, NACD, which represents the 3,000 conservation districts across the country, is a, is a real key player in this program. Um, you know, on the ground, the, the most trusted source of information, or among the most trusted source of information, are, are crop consultants and retailers. And so they are really influential on, on shifting the, the um, message at the landscape level. Um, you know, I have the privilege of, of sitting on the International CCA board with, with Isaac. That's um, how we got to know each other. And, and we're really you know, excited about the 4R nutrient management specialization and the expansion of that, which I understand will um, you know, cover this, this area soon. But this and then also you know, the 4R program supported by the Fertilizer Institute and, and other um, programs as well is, is really, really key and critical um, to get nutrient management happening at the landscape. And it, it should be happening from, from these groups um, here. Non nonprofits, NGOs, also have a really key role. And they are often really important in um, kind of collaboration and bringing a lot of the, the groups together, kind of from a watershed up um, local level uh, involvement. And so we're really happy to you know, be working with many of these groups as well as, as the departments of ag, we, you know, I think we all here know about the success of, you know, for example, the Maryland cover crop uh, program out of the Maryland Department of Ag. And so there's a, you know, a lot of investment uh, made at the state level by state departments of ag to ensure that there's resources ava available for interested farmers on, on conservation practices. So not only you know, from kind of the, the local um, landowner investment, we also rely on many other organizations to uh, help inform our program kind of of the state of the art science and what conservation practices are most effective from environmental out, um, outcomes measure, but also um, most cost effective, the challenges and barriers to implementing them, 
um, and also how they're best implemented to show environmental results. And so these are just a list of some of the, the other organizations that, that help inform our programs, um, and I'll, I'll talk about them a little bit in, in more detail. Obviously, land-grant universities are, are critical, um, and we, we rely on them for the state-of-the-art science, USDA, um, through their, their three kind of arms of NIFA, ARS, and NRCS. And then also being you know, involved in many of these professional organizations and societies keeps us abreast of um, you know, uh, the, the most kind of state-of-the-art, as I keep saying, uh, science. Okay, so I'm going to um, pivot now and talk a little bit about watershed, the watershed approach and watershed planning and why it, it's really um, important for effective conservation practice delivery. Um, and so when we think about kind of the 319 program or the National Nonpoint Source Program, we think about it at the headquarters scale. Um, you know, it's, it's, the, it's the whole country. This is where the program oversight happens. But really, as we kind of dive into the watershed projects, that's where the, the actual work is happening. And so we have 10 EPA regional offices across the country. Some of you may um, know EPA Region 3. That's based out of Philly. This is where the regional office is um, in this area. And the regions work directly with the states to help um, with set the priorities. And, and they kind of serve as the liaison between the state agencies and um, EPA headquarters. And then within the regions, obviously, are the states. And this is where they administer the 319 programs and many of the, the water quality programs. So again, I mentioned these are kind of the DNRs, the DECs, um, et cetera. And they, they're the ones who lay out the priorities for the state. But then really everything happens here at this scale. This is, this is the watershed. This is where projects are best situated for success. And this is how we think about um, you know, improving water quality over the long term is through this watershed approach. So here's an example of a HUC-12 watershed. For those of you who aren't familiar with the hydrologic unit classification, it's USGS um, watersh watershed classification system. A, a HUC-12 is a relatively small watershed. It's about um, 10,000 to 40,000 acres in size. And this is, this is where we're thinking about watershed projects. And this is where the delivery of our programs actually happens from the ground up at the watershed scale. And so what kind of what is, is the watershed approach? This is how, what, what EPA encourages is the use of watershed plans to guide implementation in a, in a given watershed. So a watershed plan can look like many different th things across the country. Um, but really, kind of generally what it is, is it's a holistic guide that's, that's um, been developed by many stakeholders that's a roadmap to clean up the watershed. Um, and in common to most, if not plans is, is the ability to identify pollutant loads, kind of the highest um, contributing areas in a watershed for pollutant loads, what the pollutants are, um, and then practices that will have a, the, the greatest impact on water quality. And so this is really um, what, what's, what's kind of in the substance of a, of a watershed plan. And what's really important in watershed planning is to ensure that there are many partners involved at the beginning of the process. And so having all of these partners that I looked earlier involved in the water planning process and the implementation process is the way that we're going to see environmental outcomes. Everybody has um, you know, a different understanding of what's happening at the watershed and their, their expertise is necessary in order to, to um, move the needle in, in the watershed. So um, I know this is kind of small to see for, for some of you, so I'm just going to walk through. This is basically the step process in, in the developing and implementing of a watershed plan. And most watershed plans follow kind of a similar progress, uh, I'm sorry, process for progress. Um, and the first step is, is one of the most important, and that's building partnership. That has to happen first to make sure everybody has a seat at the table to, to work together to, to solve the water quality problems. The second is using those partnerships and, and the variety of stakeholders who have an understanding of the hydrology and the landscape um, is to characterize your watershed and understand where the lo loads are coming from and, and to target those areas. Um, and then you can set goals, identify how the, those, how you're going to meet your, your water quality goals. Um, and then step four and five is really designing and implementing the program. 
and implementing the watershed plan itself, which is delivering the conservation practicing practices, working with um, willing landowners, et cetera. And then lastly, you know, it, it takes time to do this. Rarely, it, you know, you, you have to have kind of an adaptive management approach, and you've got to measure, measure progress to make sure that um, we're, we're meeting our goals. So one thing that we often talk about is, you know, there's many different watershed plans. Some of you may have been involved in them in the past. There's NRCS um, PL 566 plans. There's many different plans out there. There's TMDL implementation plans. But really, the robust plans that we encourage are the use of these, what we call 399 element plans. And so this are the, these are the nine elements that are within, in some way or another, every plan. And this is, this is by identifying these elements, is really how we're, we're going to meet our, our water quality goals. Um, and so I'll just, just kind of describe them quickly. Is, is the first is, is making sure that we can identify the pollutant causes and, so, and sources and estimate the load reductions that are needed to meet our, our goals. So the goals can be the water quality standard, um, et cetera. And then we've got to describe kind of with our local stakeholders what the non-point source management measures will be. So, um, you know, what, what types of practices need to be installed in what areas. Um, what, what kind of success that will give us. We also have to talk about kind of measurable in, um, milestones, what monitoring is going to happen over time to be able to see what progress is being made. And then seven and eight are really focused on what kind of outreach and um, information is necessary, how much funding do we need, um, what kind of technical assistance will need to be provided by our partners to, to get people on board. Um, and then lastly, is to schedule kind of an implementation of how long this process will take. Um, and the process takes a really long time, uh, you know, as, as we all know, working at the, at the local level. The other point I want to make is that the, um, the watershed planning process itself takes a lot of time. And it can take a couple years to think about, you know, this is a lot of information to put together to characterize your watershed. And so giving, you know, giving ourselves time um, and resources to, to be able to invest in this planning and then strategically you know, implement conservation activities after the plan has, has been developed is what's really important. And there are, um, you know, this looks different in every state. There are different groups that are um, involved in this watershed planning process. It could be the state agency. It could be a conservation district. It could be the land grant university. It could be an outreach. I'm sorry, um, more extension-based or watershed groups or um, consultant-based, but, but all of these partners have a, have a role in putting together the plan. One of the most challenging parts of developing and implementing a watershed plan is this um, concept of identifying and targeting critical areas. And I've mentioned this a few times already in the past. Um, but I'm going to dive in a little bit more into this because it's a really important concept that um, if you get one thing, you take home one thing from this presentation, it's, it's the importance of critical areas. And what we know is that in any given watershed, um, there could be a very small portion of the watershed contributing the most load or the significant portion of the load. That's, that's the nature of the beast. That's the, the hydrology in the watershed. It's not pointing fingers. It's merely the fact of you know, the proximity to the stream or the local um, conditions in the watersheds. And the critical areas can mean different things depending on where you are. It's not up to you know, me to, to identify what the critical area would be. Um, it could be, it's based on the state's priorities. So it could be proximity to a stream. It could be um, a shallow groundwater table. It could be um, a variety of considerations. Row crop fields, for, for example, could be the critical areas in the watershed. Um, and then within the, the, within the kind of a field, we all know that there are acres that are critical acres as well. That's based on slope, soils characteristics, et cetera. And so, you know, taking some time to identify those critical areas up front and, and putting some outreach and targeted efforts in those water quality and those critical areas is how we're going to get water quality results. If we don't identify these areas and target them effectively, water quality results are elusive. We know that from land-grant university science, USDA science. And so if we're really going to get a return on our investments and, and st spend our mo money most strategically, it's, it's really important to identify these areas. It's also important to recognize maybe where there are areas that have um, that need to be protected because they are contributing to relatively good water quality. And so that's another um, 
you know, point in consideration when looking at your watershed. So this is just an example from um, one watershed plan in, in Salt Creek, Indiana. But there are a variety of tools out there available to help um, stakeholders identify critical areas. ARS, USDA, really great tools out there for supporting the use of some of these through, through grant funding. Um, but also something as easy as a GIS layer with cropland and um, drainage characteristics is another way of, of doing that. But it really has to come from the state and the, and the group to determine how they, they best want to identify these areas. We also know that, um, you know, not one single practice is a silver bullet. There are trade-offs among conservation practices. Um, you know, for example, nitrogen and phosphorus in different practices, terrace, terraces is one example of that. So being able to have a plan in place where you identify what the pollutant is um, and the types of practices that might help you with that pollutant is really the best way to, to improve water quality. And one way to ensure that we, we're doing that is if we uh, implement practices as, in a systems approach. I think everyone here recognizes um, the importance of systems of practices that avoid control and trap nutrients, um, but over time, these are really the most effective way of, of providing environmental results, but also um, even economic benefits in, in the future as well. So I just want to, um, I, I mentioned this, I guess this um, second bullet here, but some other water quality resources that are, are really important and help us with our program that you all might also be interested in. Um, one that I, I is just... <laughs> Great is the USDA Conservation Project. You may have heard it this as SEEP. Um, this is a really great program that USDA has that it allows us to link environmental outcomes to on the ground conservation practice implementation. So we're able to see how delivery of USDA programs have affected um, you know, our environmental outcomes. This one here is the Chesapeake, the most recent Chesapeake Bay SEEP report. Thank you, Isaac. Um, so this, this came out a couple years ago. You might be interested in seeing kind of what the conservation practice delivery was like in the Chesapeake Bay region. Um, and then the second point I want to make, I mentioned quickly the, the National Aquatic Resources Survey. This is the kind of collaboration between EPA states um, and tribes, which provides a general kind of overview picture snapshot of um, the conditions of our nation's rivers, lakes, estuarine areas, wetlands, it's kind of a five-year rotating cycle. And you might have seen some press releases about, you know, the status of our, our nation's rivers in good, fair, poor condition. Um, and this allows us to see over time kind of trends related to um, the, the conditions of our nation's water. So these are the, again, the, the, um, the different sample points across the country that are leading to the, the, the roll-up of this national picture of our, our nation's rivers, streams, wetlands, coastal areas, um, and lakes. <clears throat> so I'm going to pivot again now and just talk about some of the, the voluntary programs that we have and that you might be involved in or you may want to be involved in and how this has led to um, some water quality progress. And that's through the National Water Quality Initiative. So um, here's a map of the NWQI. I'm going to talk about what these watersheds are. but. You know, you, you all, some of you may work in some of the, the watersheds here, which are priority watersheds for the state um, and NRCS as well. So what this initiative is, is it was, it's launched in 2012, so we've been in the initiative about five years now. It's a um, collaborative effort between USDA, NRCS, EPA, and state water quality agencies. And the goal is to improve water quality from small, HUC-12 again, um, agricultural watersheds across the country that have been impaired for nutrients, sediment, and pathogens. Um, and so what is happening is NRCS is investing significantly in these priority watersheds. These are watersheds that have been identified um, in collaboration with state water quality agencies. Um, and they're spending about 5% of their EQIP funds, NRCS, on water quality focused practices in these watersheds. So um, that's about 125 to 133 million dollars annually. It's a significant investment from NRCS on key water quality focused practices. Um, and what's happening is then states are coming in and monitoring in a subset of these watersheds for water quality progress. So over time, we'll be able to link again conservation investments to water quality um, improvements. 
So uh, th this is an example. Some of you are, you know, you're probably familiar with some of the core, what we call core water quality practices um, at NRCS, and these are some that are offered under the, the NWQI. And I want to bring up this initiative because many of the components that I've already talked about, about making sure there's stakeholder investment, a robust planning in place, the ability to, to target and have long-term investments, which are really critical for water quality improvements, are found through the National Water Quality Initiative. And so um, this is, these are elements that are, are likely to contribute to success all through the voluntary approach um, working with, with stakeholders. And I'm just going to put in one quick plug for um, a recent program that NRCS launched through the, the National Water Quality Initiative, which is um, basically upfront planning and resources available to um, you know, develop outreach plans, develop assessments before conservation practices go into place. So before they can provide um, financial assistance for conservation practices, there's a year of upfront planning. And this is really, um, really exciting to us. This is how we're, you know, we're likely to see water quality change over time. How am I doing, Isaac? OK, 10 minutes. 12 minutes, great. OK. so. Um, I mentioned a few of the grants that we have. I just want to talk about, we, we, you know, that we have the 319 program, which gives grants to states to implement their, their, their programs. But we also have um, discretionary funds that we use to support a variety of activities that um, work to, to improve, uh, you know, collaboration at the local scale. And so, as I mentioned, um, you know, consultants and crop advisors and, and conservation districts um, are all critical players in, in um, implementing and, and getting conservation implemented at the landscape level. And so we've um, supported a series of grants um, through our 319 program to ensure that there's training and um, you know, opportunities to, to connect these groups on kind of the high impact practices. So um, <clears throat> one was on um, you know, ag drainage water management and how to effectively use that, especially in the, in the Midwest. Um, watershed planning efforts um, for, for consultants, ag retailers, CCAs, et cetera. Um, and then we recently just finished up a grant um, I had with the University of Missouri and the Sustainable Ag Research and Education um, Center, SAIR, that many of you are familiar with, which basically links um, the direct and indirect effects of co cover crops on water quality. So we know about the benefits that that cover crops have on, on soil health and um, some economic benefits over the long term as well, but there's significant nutrient benefits. And so we conducted a literature um, review linking these benefits of, um, of this, this really important practice and sharing it with the ag community. So um, this will be posted soon. If anybody's interested in some of these resources, we have, we have quite a few, and I'm, I'm happy to share them with, with all of you. We want to make sure we get it out to community. So I would be remiss if I didn't talk a little bit about our animal ag work as well, kind of um, to supplement the regulatory program that already exists. So we, you know, we know that the, the voluntary programs with the ag industry and the ag, animal ag community are, are really, really important and valuable to, to improve water quality over, over time. And so I'm going to just talk about kind of two of our voluntary um, programs that we have in the Office of Wastewater Management. So if you, if you have particular questions, this is my, my colleague's um, contact, and he'd be happy to answer any questions um, about kind of the animal ag work, um, which basically we have the animal ag discussion group. And this is really an informal group of um, industry, so from the four um, animal ag industries. Um, land grant universities, states, nonprofits, and, and EPA as well, and, and NRCS, they, they convene regularly to talk about the, kind of the status of manure management and what the issues are facing manure and water quality. And so one thing that was kind of identified is making sure that there's an open line of communication and a two-way discussion between landowners and EPA and state employees. So we, we recently launched what's called the Ag Education Project. If you're interested, you can, you can Google this here and you can find the trainings and modules online. But this is a way to share kind of some of the challenges with EPA staff, state staff, um, but also with farmers that, um, of the kind of manure issue and dealing with manure across the country. So if you're interested, these are all available. 
online and we're going to continue to, to um, provide these trainings over time. And then the next one I want to point out is our nutrient recycling challenge. So, you know, we have a really um, productive animal ag industry in the country and with that comes a lot of manure and what we typically think about is waste. But, um, you know, that we, we really want to think about this as a valuable resource as well. And so there's a lot of uh, challenges associated with the manure imbalances across the country and transporting manure, but are there ways that we can identify cost-effective strategies that will help landowners more effectively use manure um, in a way that will, you know, in encourage their crop production but also improve water quality. So a couple years ago we launched what's called the Nutrient Recycling Challenge. You can Google it. It's, it's kind of uh, all over there. There's a lot of partners, as you see here, that are interested from industry to uh, corporate uh, groups as well. And so the, the idea is to develop these affordable technologies. There's some really great innovative ideas that have come in. If you're interested in what those are, you know, I can put you in touch with the, the leads. Um, but this is a, a really exciting uh, program that we launched a few years ago. So um, I think with that, I'm going to just spend the last couple minutes here talking about, you know, so I, I kind of framed the, the challenge. I talked about um, the 319 program and, and how we're able to work with the ag community to, to improve water quality. So what I'm going to do is just talk about a few of our um, case studies here in the Chesapeake Bay region, working with the, with the ag community on some water quality issues and how we were able to collectively um, improve water quality. And so I um, apologize for, for my notes here, but like I said, we have 731 of these across the country. So um, <clears throat> I'm going to start with a story in, in Virginia. Is anybody from this area? No. Okay, well, so in Hall, Byers, and Hutton Creeks, this is in um, Virginia. So back in 1998, there were some issues related to um, sediment loadings from, from crop land and pasture land, and most of the watershed was actually in uh, pasture, so about 57%, um, and then there was about 10% in, in crop land in the watershed, and this was contributing to um, sediment lotion, uh, loadings. So over time, the, the state worked with many partners to implement um, a series of kind of conservation practices that included the livestock, livestock exclusion, which we know is, is a really important practice. Um, there were cover crops, nutrient management, riparian forest buffers, et cetera, that were impl implemented in the watershed. And then over time, in 2014, the state was able to um, remove this water body from the 303D list of impairments. So um, there was no longer a sediment issue that was relating to the water quality um, impairments or, or standards. So the water body was now re, uh, meeting water quality standards. Um, so there was that successful story in, in Virginia. Moving over to, to West Virginia and the North Fork Folk Potomac watershed, anybody from that area? No, oh, darn. Um, this, this was um, really kind of a result of the changes of the poultry industry in the early 1990s resulted in, um, you know, some bacteria and fecal coliform issues in, in this watershed. And so basically what happened is there's this is a really good success story where many local groups worked together with 319 funds and USDA funds um, to get landowners interested in installing waste management conservation practices. And these included um, the stream bake fencing, roofs over manure, um, manure storage facilities, and a lot of this was using 319 funds, but greater than 85% of the farmers in the, in the watershed enrolled and were able to work together to, to install conservation practices, which now led to um, this water body is no longer impaired. So it's now meeting water quality standards and they're, they're good to go for, for fecal coliform in this um, watershed. And then lastly, anybody from, from <laughs> Knox, Knox Town in Delaware? Yay! <laughs> I got somebody. Um, so this is kind of an interesting issue. There was a bacteria and nutrient issue in, in this um, water body, both from point sources and non-point sources. In fact, they, they were, were able to sh um, share that the conversion of row crop ag to urban areas actually led um, to more problems in the watershed. Um, but the, the conservation district, which is the new Castle County 
um, conservation district works together. They were kind of the lead on this project to install a series of conservation, or to work with landowners, sorry, to install a series of conservation practices. Um, they also did some restored streaming. And over time, there was about 10 years of, of implementation. They were able to show that the water quality, um, DINREC came in and showed that the water quality standards were now being met for, for bacteria. Um, and it's no longer listed on the, the 303D list. So, um, you know, I just wanted to make the point that there's, it takes a lot, it takes an army and it takes a lot of people working together to solve these issues that we can't do it um, single-handedly and, and that um, being able to work collective, you know, collaboratively from like a watershed planning, watershed perspective is really the way that we're, we're going to see water quality results and how we're able to see success stories um, across the country. So with that, um, I'm going to leave you with a few of the references that I, I talked about over um, the presentation this morning. Feel free to check those out. Um, I think we might have a few minutes for questions, but if, if I can't get to all the questions, here's my email, here's my number. Feel free to reach out. Um, if, I, if I can't answer the question, I'll put you in touch with somebody that, that might have the answer. So thanks for your time. Yes. Yeah, that's a great question. So I did see some in North Dakota um, in Idaho, which was um, kind of the roller crimpers for no-till cover crop operations. So there's a, it, it can fund um, low-cost rental payments. So if, if, the, if the equipment is being used to provide you know, low-cost rental payments to other landowners, 318 funds can be used, because I think that there's NRCS funds cannot support um, that so it has been used, but again, the idea is to get many people within the community using that equipment, that conservation uh, equipment. So, good question. Other questions? All right, I'd like to uh, thank Erica for her Thanks, presentation. Isaac.